happy to have you with us again today, Christian friends, as we continue, continue our discussion and study of Jesus as a metaphorical theologian. You know, those of us who are in the Western world and are thereby the inheritors of the Greco-Roman heritage and mindset have a very special problem. And that problem is the fact that from the Greek heritage, going clear back to the 5th century BC with the great classical age of Greece, there is a tendency to make this division between the body and the soul, where the Greeks said, yes, you, are a, you have a body and you have a soul, and the soul is placed in this body, and the body is somehow some kind of a prison. And so the intellectual life, the spiritual life, is to attempt to try and, as much as possible, set that body aside, ignore it, separate yourself from it, because it's the source of evil in life. And so the goal of spirituality is to have nothing to do with the body. And this sort of dichotomy of the division between body and soul continues to feed into the spirituality of the Christian church and has all across the centuries. But properly understood, the New Testament does not find its intellectual roots in Greek classicism, but in the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, there is no such dichotomy between body and spirit. Indeed, there, body and spirit come together in a unity which is called the nephesh, cognate, which cognates with the Hebrew, with the Arabic nefs, which is a word which we still use very commonly in the Middle East, and this means your whole person. And your whole person is thereby this total fusion of body and soul. And so thereby, for Paul, it's impossible to talk about the resurrection without including the resurrection of the body, which he, of course, defines as a spiritual body. Nevertheless, there is a body which resurrects. Now, this means, of course, that we cannot talk about a spiritual gospel in isolation from the reality of the physical world in which our souls are placed and in which God in his creation has placed us as human beings. And so there is the constant sort of um, pressure to somehow make this isolation, but for Jesus this never happens. When we get the Lord's Prayer, right in the middle of it is the requirement that we should ask for our daily bread, and we ask for it. It is a gift. It comes to us not as something we have earned, but something that comes to us in an unmerited fashion. And so, amazing to find, we discover that Jesus, in fact, has more to say about money than he does about prayer. And whenever he discusses money, it's always in the context of money is something that is not yours. You are a steward over it and you are responsible for that portion which God has given to you, and you are accountable. But it's not yours. You don't own it. You don't earn something, and after having earned it, have the right to alone decide what is going to happen to that which falls within your power. Granted, the New Testament certainly makes clear that private property is legitimate, and we see this perhaps most clearly in the book of Acts, in which uh, Peter is talking to Ananias and Sapphira and says to them that this was yours and you had the right to do with it as you liked. You didn't have to turn it into the church, but having done so, you shouldn't tell lies about it. So there is there the affirmation of the right to private property, but even that private property is not ours. We are stewards over it in the presence of a God who has given it to us. Now, Thereby, we need to look at our Lord's primary parable in which he is discussing some of the aspects of these things. And this is in the great parable of what we have called the rich fool, which has themes going in it that often we fail to appreciate. Let's take a look for a minute at the text. I presume you have the sheet showing the indentations and divisions of the text in your hands before you, and so perhaps you can follow along on the screen even though all the words may not be clear. Let's look at it for a minute. Jesus was quite willing to be interrupted, and somebody interrupts him and asks him a question, and the question is over the topic of the just division of land, 
We'll come back and talk about that. And then Jesus answers the initial quest by a rejection. But in fact, the rejection is a call for a new vision. The new vision begins with what we call a wisdom saying. This sort of little nugget of truth uh, could be understood as a kind of a proverb by itself. And the parable ends, look down at the bottom, if you will, with a second wisdom saying of the kind that make up the book of Proverbs. The parable itself then occurs between, in the envelope, if you please, between these two wisdom sayings. And the parable begins with the story of a man whose land brings forth plenty, and the parable ends with all of that, of those goods, all of that plenty is taken from him. And then the action of the story takes place in the middle, in which, first of all, we have one scene in which he enunciates his problem, and then a second scene in which he decides in the present what he is going to do, and then a third scene in which he reflects on the future on the basis of his solution. So problem, solution in the present, and solution in the future are the ways in which these three central themes move within an envelope of God gave it to him, God took it away from him, within an envelope of two wisdom sayings, all of it introduced then by a dialogue on the question of justice. Keeping the sheet in front of you, let us turn now and try to move through this great dialogue and parable and see what our Lord is saying. He begins, as we see, by someone coming to him and saying, teacher, and this is the word that Luke uses for rabbi. He doesn't use the Hebrew word probably because Theophilus, the Greek speaking person for whom he probably wrote the book, who is mentioned in the first verses, uh, may not know what a rabbi is. So somebody has come to Jesus and said, Rabbi, you go tell my brother to divide up the inheritance with me. Now, the scene is pretty well clear in that the father has died, there is an estate, the estate is held between two brothers according to the law of the Jews, it could not be divided unless the older brother decided that it should be. So the younger brother in this case, presumably here, asks that Jesus should go and press his older brother to make the division because he, the younger brother, wants the division. Now, what he's crying out for is justice in the division of land. The division of land is the most sensitive problem that our Middle Eastern world knows anything about. And the cry of justice across our world for the division of land and also for the division of property and many other forms of justice are, is one of the great cries of the human soul in the 20th century. People all across the world are fighting for one concept of justice or another. Now, we have to be we have to be very careful when we look at what Jesus is here saying. He does not oppose this man's cry for justice. But what he does do is he says, look, you have already had a fight with your brother. The relationship between the two of you is already broken. And you have already decided that you are right and he is wrong. And now you are coming to me and saying, okay, Jesus, you go and tell him I'm right and he's wrong and he's got to give me my rights. Now, this fellow does not come to Jesus and say, Jesus, my brother and I have loved each other in the past. There has been a quarrel. We have fought. We are now divided. There is danger lest this division should solidify into a permanent break, and I am concerned. Will you listen to me and listen to him and make reconciliation between us? Perhaps I am mistaken. Perhaps he is mistaken. Perhaps we are both mistaken. No, that isn't what he says. He says, you go tell my brother to give me my rights, meaning 
the division is now happened, has now happened, it's over, I want mine, and I want to go my way, and I'm right, of course, and he's wrong, now you pressure him into giving me what I want. Well, there was never anybody who managed to pressure Jesus into uh, giving them what they wanted. If you want to get Jesus upset, why well, you just come to him with your own agenda and you try and tweak his nose and get out of him what you think you want and you're going to be in trouble. So was this man. And Jesus responds and says, man, which in our Middle Eastern speech is a very rough way to talk to people, we still use this phrase, Ya Rajal, O oh man. And this phrase means, I'm not going to use your name and I'm not going to call you friend because I'm not very happy with you. I'll just call you O oh man. It's a colloquialism and is a very strong one. O oh man, he says, Ya Rajal, who made me a judge and a divider? Is that why I've come? Now, granted, many of the rabbis were experts in law Basically, a religious person in the first century was a person who made himself into an expert in the law of Moses because that was the central focus of religion for the Jews. And so thereby, the person who can really give you the fine points of the interpretation of the law, these people are the rabbis, and you go to them when you want some, some help in some legal question. But Jesus says, that's not why I have come. I'm not that type. And granted, some of the rabbis deferred from trying to make these kinds of legal pronouncements. So he says, I have not come as a judge or a divider. Moses, if you remember the story, saw two of his fellow uh, kinsmen fighting and he tried to enter between them and make a division and they said, who made you a judge over us? They didn't like it. He wanted to become a divider and they weren't sure they wanted him, at least those two weren't. Jesus has been asked to be a divider and he has refused. Now what's the opposite of a divider? The opposite is obviously a reconciler. And Jesus has come as a reconciler, not a divider. He wants to bring people together and not finalize separations between them. I don't think this means that Jesus is indifferent to the cries of justice. There are too many parables in which he picks up the downtrodden, whether they be the oppressed of society, the outcasts of society, the displaced women of that society, and he picks them up and insists upon them being given their rights. There are too many parables which show his very finely honed concern for social justice in the world in which he lives. This parable gives us the other side of the coin. And the other side of the coin is perhaps as clearly stated as any place I have ever read it in a book by a great missionary theologian of our day, a great world Christian thinker and statesman in the circles of the church by the name of Leslie Newbegin. This man, Scottish of origin, was elected by the Indians as their own bishop in the United Church of South India. And in one of his most recent books, he talks about the theology of mission of our day, and the book is entitled The Open Secret. And in that book, he has one chapter on the question of justice. And he writes as follows. If we acknowledge the God of the Bible, we are committed to struggle for justice in society. Justice means giving to each his due. Our problem as seen in the light of the gospel, is that each of us overestimates what is due him in compared with what is due to his neighbor. If I do not acknowledge a justice which judges the justice for which I fight, I am, not a, I am an agent not of justice but of lawless tyranny. It has been my privilege for the past 27 years to live in the Middle East. And I have seen many communities on many different issues, each of them with an enormous sense of self-righteousness, determined that all they're fighting for is a pure concept of justice. But there is no concept of justice beyond them which judges them 
and that thereby they end up fighting not for justice, but for a lawless tyranny. And our world is full of this kind of a lawless tyranny. When the prophet Habakkuk is talking about the coming of the Babylonians, the most awesome thing he can say about them, the most frightening thing to his own soul is their justice proceeds from themselves. What could be worse? There is no concept of a God of justice who judges them. You see, the difficulty is the person who fights for a just cause thinks that he is thereby a just person. I fight for a good cause. I am a good man. No, that equation doesn't follow. I may be fighting for a good cause, and I may be a ruthless killer. But the fighting for a good cause somehow colors my mind, and I see myself as a great hero for justice, and thereby everything I do in the fighting for that cause in my eyes becomes right if I am not judged by a justice that is beyond me. If there is no self-criticism, if there is no turning of the lights on myself to see what is happening to me in the middle of this struggle, then woe to those who fall under the sway of my so-called justice. So within the very keen and very intense and very perceptive awareness of and struggle for justice in human society, which our Lord demonstrates again and again from the very first time he spoke in the very first sermon in his very first presentation in the synagogue in Nazareth in Luke 4. From then on, he is concerned for these things. But here we find the need for a new perspective on ourselves as we cry out for justice. And that's what this parable is about. So what does he say to this fellow? After he gives them this kind of a sharp rebuke, man, I didn't come to divide people up. He doesn't turn on to a new topic. He's really saying to this fellow, you're sitting there arguing with your brother. And the trouble is, you are sitting here looking at him this way, and he's sitting here looking at you. Now, what you need to do is get up out of your chair and come over here and look at the two of you from a new perspective. If you can do that, there will be created for you the ground, the vision out of which it will be possible for you to bring about a better solution than the finalizing of the divisions between you. And so he calls upon this man for, to look at his problem and himself from a new perspective. And so we get the first of these wisdom sayings. What is it? He says, take heed and beware of all covetousness, for a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Or the word covetousness can better be uh, defined because this is what the Greek word specifically means as insatiable desires. The problem with material goods is that unless we are somehow delivered from our fear that we will not have enough, one of the basic fears of the human soul, then regardless of how much we get, there is a drive and a pressure within us to get more. There is never quite enough. The sense of, of security is never fully satisfied. And so all of life is spent in trying to amass more. You know, it's amazing the extent to which the mentality of this penetrates all of our consciousness. I was in a large American city last week and going to a, a church meeting, and the church meeting happened to be in a wealthy suburb, and so the pastor who was taking me to that meeting said, well, Ken, uh, the church, this church is in one of the nicer sections of the city. And I said, uh, apparently in your mind, Jim, you have equated nice with expensive and he stopped for a minute and he said, well, yes, of course, that's the way we use the word. And I said to him, uh, Jim, I don't uh, accept the equation. 
a nice home for me is a simple home that reflects authentically a traditional culture with its values of, of long extent. I want to find out who these people are and where they have come from. And a one-room simple peasant home that authentically represents an authentic culture with a long tradition behind it. And the wisdom of that culture is to me a nice home. And the word expensive and the word nice are not necessarily to be put together. And so our problem is the insatiable desires. And so Jesus says, beware of these insatiable desires. A man's life does not consist in the surpluses. And then he goes on to tell a story about a man with surpluses. We could talk a long time about what rights do we have over the surpluses which come to us in the kind of an economic structures within which we find ourselves. And as Christians, we are obliged on the basis of this parable to discuss these things. This goes beyond our time now. I merely point out to you that this wisdom saying is discussing both insatiable desires and the surpluses of material things which come to us which we do not need. So then he begins the parable. The parable itself is a retelling of an older parable already told by Ben Sirach, a famous philosopher of Jerusalem who wrote about 195 B.C. And Jesus has retold it a bit. That story is about a man who with, uh, with cunning and with uh, deception and with uh, greed manages to amass wealth. But this story, no. This is a man, there was a certain ma rich man, the man already has enough, whose land brought forth plenty. So now he already has enough, and he finally d discovers under his power increased wealth, which obviously he can use but doesn't need. And so the question is, what's he going to do with this? And so the next scene we find, it says, and he dialogued with himself. It doesn't say he said to himself. The word is very specific, and in Greek it's dialogue, just like we have it in English. And this is a very sad text. In the Middle East, Middle Eastern peasants always make up their minds about important topics after long discussions with their friends. The villages are very tight-knit. Uh, even in the city of Beirut, I live in an apartment building, and there's an alley right beside us, and our neighbors are about as far away from, from uh, me as I am from you as you sit watching your screen. And so we call to one another across the balconies and hang out our wash, and everybody's business is everybody else's. And everything you do, you do in discussion with the people around you. And the slightest decision of life comes after many hours of palaver with your family and your friends. Ah, but this man is a man who doesn't seem to have any friends. The increased wealth that has come to him has gradually isolated him from the human family around him, and now when he sits down to palaver with his friends, the only person he can find to talk to is himself. And so the only person out there is he can have a dialogue with himself because the cronies aren't there. It's been amazing to me to notice a phenomena all over the world, from the great houses of Arabia to the palatial summer dwellings of the mountains of Lebanon, to Europe and America, that the more wealth people acquire, the farther they withdraw from their neighbors. The larger house they get with the larger ground around it, and they gradually withdraw away from people. I'm not sure I completely understand why, but Isaiah says, Woe to you who join house to house and dwell alone in the midst of the land. What an awesome thing, what a frightening thing, what a tragic thing, when the warmth of the human family around you is broken by the fact of the accumulation of wealth, which is what has happened to this fellow. And he says, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. He doesn't understand that this is a gift and it's not his, that he is responsible to use it as God would direct him. It's only my crops. 
and he doesn't think of the, think of the fact that he didn't do any more work to produce it this year than last year. This is a bumper crop come to him out of the bounty of God. None of this crosses his mind. It's mine, and I'm going to do with it what I like. Ambrose, the famous Latin theologian of the fourth century, says the place to store things like this is in the mouths of the needy. Or Augustine, Ambrose's student of North Africa, says that it's like a man who stores his grain on the ground floor and it gets wet and he needs to store it somewhere else. He'd better move it up to the second floor where it won't get wet and rot. And the second floor is to store your excess wealth in treasures in heaven where moth and rust will not consume and thieves will not break through and steal. He doesn't see it this way. He says, I will do this. The climax in the middle is the bright idea that he's got. I will pull down my barns and build larger barns and store all my grain and my goods. Now, he's not going to lift a single finger. He's a rich man. He's going to stand there and order other people to do it. But there's no mention of his workers, no mention of his carpenters, no mention of his builders. He talks as though he were, as we would say in Arabic, al-kull fil kull. He's everything and is going to do everything. So now we've got my crops, my barn, my grain, and my goods. And finally, we get to the end and he says, and I will say to my soul, again, no cronies, he's all alone. Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Take ease, eat, drink, and relax. And the word here is, is euphron. It's, it's, it's the word for the diaphragm, and euphron means you've got a lot of it, and you, ah, boy, you've made it. You've got a million dollars in a numbered Swiss account, and nobody's going to touch you, and you have really made it. And he thinks he's reached the absolute pinnacle of the ease in life, but he is pathetic in his isolation. And then God says to him, you think that with all of this accumulated wealth that you have reached the position of, of euphron, of a great extended diaphragm, lots of it, you've, ah, you've made it. And the word for fool that is used is the word aphron. You're without any guts at all. You are without a diaphragm. You are a person who now is completely stupid, having thought that this equation would bring to you the good life. This night, your soul is required back as a loan. You thought all of this stuff was yours. It wasn't. It was on loan. Even your soul was on loan. And you, I'm going to take back the loan of your soul, and then we'll see what's going to happen. And the saddest part of all is at the end in which he says, and who are these things going to be? Everybody's got some family, even Howard Hughes. But this fellow, after the big fight as to who's going to get his wealth, he can't even tell you who's going to win because he doesn't know. And so the final last word of the results of his life is a great big fight. And at the end of the great big fight, he can't even tell who's going to get the goodies. And so, he says at the end, is the one treasuring up for himself and not treasuring up for God. I prefer to translate these both as actives. We are to labor that we might offer gifts to God. He doesn't need anything from us, but we are to labor to offer him our gifts. And in that sense, we are treasuring up for God. This young man is called upon to look at the problem of economic justice for which he struggles, not from the point of view of where's mine and how much is his and let's finalize the quarrel between us, but from the perspective of let us look at who's, who owns all of it, that which is under the authority of my brother and under my authority and we will discover that it is not mine. It's on loan to both of us, and that we can destroy ourselves by these unsatiable desires. My soul is on loan, my goods are on loan, and I am responsible as a steward before God for both of them. And I yearn that this perspective on material things 
might be the perspective out of which all of us might act, that we too might seek justice and at the same time look within our souls to perceive and to enunciate and to live out the perspectives of our Lord.